Okay, um, I like it. I think it's a good definition. There's no one uh, consistent definition. There is a definition of what is a molecule. Uh, there's no clear definition of what is a business model. To me, it's about value, and it's also about capability. How is it that you get the capability, including human talent is the big one, but also other capability like physical resources, financial uh, talent, and so on, to be able to create value and deliver uh, value. And um, throughout the 20th century, we had a model for doing that. It was called the Industrial Age Corporation. And it did everything from soup to nuts inside the boundaries of the corporation. And along comes um, the early days of transportation, the telephone, f facsimile, information technology, then the internet, then the social web. And each of these had the effect of lowering transaction and collaboration costs in an open market. And that meant that we could start to get the capability to create value from outside the boundaries of a company rather than inside. So the whole reason that we're here talking about new business models is because the way that we orchestrate capability is changing very fundamentally. That talent can now be outside the boundaries of a company, not just inside. And so that leads to all kinds of new things. I mean, a big one here, if you look around, it's called peer production. Peers can now come together and create value. So. If you, can create an, uh, shh. if you can create an encyclopedia with a million people who've never met, what else could you create? Could you create a computer operating system? Well, Linux. Could you create a physical good like a motorcycle without a company? Well, the Chinese motorcycle industry is hundreds of little organizations. They meet in tea houses and on the internet. There's no... Harley Davidson, there's no OEM pulling all the strings, and this is now 40% of global motorcycle production. And get ready for the $1,000 car from China using the same model. So something like that was unthinkable prior to the internet. And that's why the topic of business models is a huge topic today. Thank you very much. Thanks, Don. Um, Simon, so from a, a Google point of view, how does Google orchestrate this capability that Don was talking about, or what does new business models mean to you and to Google? Well, as I think as Don said, there are there are lots of potential new business models out there, and you know, I mean, I'd like to sort of work through one of the transformative sort of axiomatic bits that's going on in the uh, it, as a result of technology, and look at the business models that emerge from that. But there are lots and lots of them. That's that's clear. Uh, I mean, the one that the one that I would focus on is is the bit that comes from Moore's law, from Crider's law, um, the, the, the doubling of the, of the computing capacity, the hardware capacity, and then also the revolution that's happened in the consumer electronics industry, which means that we get much, much more creation of, uh, of content and of data, um, and we've got a much stronger capacity to analyze that data. So, you know, just recently Google made available um, some of its, uh, its computing capacity in the form of a new, new sort of, uh, well, they call it. I think they call it cloud compute, and it's a, you know, it's a, it's a capacity to analyze masses and masses of data. So we've got a technology now that creates lots and lots of data, and we've got technologies to be able to analyze that data. And that's, that is something that is sort of axiomatic in the in the technology. And then the question is, is what does that mean at the at the business model level? Um, and I think the one of the business models that's emerged from all of this is with lots and lots of data. The challenge is to be able to find the value within that data. So this is one of the value creation exercises um, that, that you described, finding the data within when you've got lots and lots of it. Now, that's not to be mistaken with accessing data. So you need to be able to find something on the internet, and then there's a question of whether you access that. And, uh, and this is a distinction that's, that's not very well understood, for example, by rights holders. Um, if you know, any of you that are not from Germany, please find a, a, a German nearby and ask what, they're trying, what the newspaper industry is trying to do to copyright. I mean, they're making a real mess of it because they're trying to confuse accessing, um, accessing content, newspaper content in this case, with the discovery of, of articles. And the, the newspaper industry are concerned that it's just too easy to find 
all of the news out there relative to to the to the content that they consider they consider premium um, uh, and should be at the, the heart of all of this. Now. That leads to, um, so, so discovery is the service that, that Google provides, right? And, and the sweet spot is to be the, the, the person that helps people that are looking for something to buy and the people that want to sell. Now we do that from a search perspective, but Amazon do it from a direct sort of e-commerce perspective. Facebook have got to play in this from a social perspective. And then Apple are in the same space, trying to sort of mediate all of this through their, through their app store. But this is the, I mean, th this is the, this is the main battleground, I would say, in in terms of the discovery, uh, the, the 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 concept of, of discovery, which is one of the new business models which emerges as a result of the fact that it's so much easier to to create. For there's so much more data, so much more creation of data out there. Now that's as in terms of new business models, but it doesn't have to be just as a new service that you create it. The ability to work with and to do uh, and to discover data within a company is obviously just as important. Can you run your business more efficiently by, by looking at the data that emerges inside a business? So this is something that SAP, a, a German company, has obviously been helping uh, companies around the world do for, for years, and, and IBM and Oracle uh, do, do the same sort of stuff. Um, and looking at the data that's available inside companies is a, is a huge source of, uh, of potential value in, in the future. So when, when, big da um, when McKinsey looked at uh, the, the area of big data, they came to the conclusion that the retail industry, which is obviously like a huge part of the economy, you could increase margins there by 60% by using the data that emerges from, from, the retail, from a retail business activity. You can increase margins by 60%. If you look at the difference between the EU and the US, one of the major things that distinguishes why the US has a higher GDP than we do in Europe is the retail sector. So what Walmart does, very few companies in Europe do, it leads to more value in the, uh, in, in the US economy. And this can be generalized beyond, um, beyond the area of, uh, of just retail. There's an, an MIT professor called Eric Brynjolfsson who's looked at how, uh, he's looked at companies and how they use data. And the conclusions that he's done, this is using, looking at US companies, those companies that really, really analyze the data that's available inside a business, they're 6% more productive than those that don't analyze the data. Now, Google is one of those companies that analyzes the data uh, in, 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 in absolute minutiae. There's a, there's a phrase that, that Eric Schmidt, um, our executive chairman and former CEO, likes to, likes to say, um, in God we trust, but everyone else must bring data. And that's very much the principle that's involved in, uh, in developing products and services inside Google. Use the data that's available. Websites, of course, kick up masses and masses of data. Uh, we analyze the click stream. We provide services such as Google Analytics to allow you know, maybe some of the startups that are, that are here to, anal you know, to start analyzing the data. Analyzing that data is a key, is a key and critical um, uh, economic uh, opportunity for everybody. Thanks very much. Um, John, from, a, from a, the perspective of, of open society, of open innovation, of uh, open source technology, how does this idea of new business models, what does it mean to you? Sure, let me actually start out kind of in the development world. In the development world, new business models are a breath of fresh air. Um, because you look at 50 years of international development, and it hasn't failed, but it hasn't succeeded either. And compare that to one decade of mobile phone technology, which has done more to empower people across the world to contribute to change their world, to really engage their governments. I'd argue the mobile phone has done a lot more. Um, so this, this level of systems change in the development world is really amazingly powerful and it is exposing these new models and finding them uh, and then supporting them, but being able to figure out which ones to support how to do it. Uh, specifically, kind of back to your point on, on the role of open source, it provides such an amazing platform uh, for change. Uh, small organizations with really big ideas but microscopic budgets can start out on an open source platform and, and grow to scale on that same platform and never have to worry about their technology, having to rebuild it, recode it, start from scratch. They can continue growing. You know, they can turn a Drupal site on in five minutes and five years down the road still be on whatever version of Drupal that they are on then. So that, that ability to scale using open source uh, is just sea changing for the, the social change world. 
Okay, well, why are we talking about the, the geek economy? What is it about um, the development of technology nowadays that is allowing for these new business models that we're, we're talking about? I don't know who wants to, to take that. Well, we're talking about the geek economy because it's the geek in the economy that is changing the, the creating the new opportunities for businesses. I mean, obviously, I mean, just look at this. I mean, you know, we're sitting in the middle of the worst recession that we've known for, for several decades. And you can just sort of feel the entrepreneurial energy in a place like this, led by, led by the geeks. Now, you know, go back, you know, swing right back up to the macroeconomic level. The, the internet economy is 4.1% of GDP in the, in the G20 countries, but it represents 20% of the GDP growth over the last, over the last several years. So, you know, it, it's, it's, the, it's the people here and it's the, it, it's the, the energy here, but, but also it's taking the, the geek and taking them inside businesses or working with them, you know, in a, in a, in a social environment too, that is creating the new, the new value opportunities inside businesses. And that's because, the, you know, as geeks, we, we naturally focus in on things like the, 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 the opportunities from technology rather than seeing it as threats. And I think that's really, you know, the, the biggest challenge that we face as a society is that we see technology as a threat rather than an opportunity. Yeah, I, th I think you've got four factors leading to the geek economy. The first is that it's possible because of the internet and the web. And, and the web is not about websites or eyeballs or stickiness or clicks or page views or any of that. It's a global computational platform that radically drops transaction and collaboration costs, which means that people, turns out geeks, can come together and collaborate in ways that were previously unthinkable. I mean, humanity built this big computer called the internet, and we all share it. And every time we go on it, we're programming it. Whether you're doing a Google search or remixing something, or whether you're uploading a photo onto Pinterest or whatever, you're programming this big global computer. The second thing is we have a demographic revolution. The children of the baby boom in the United States and other countries, in Europe, the children of the post-World War II generation, and most of you are from this generation, you're born between 1978 and 1997 inclusive, you're the first generation to come of age in the digital age, and your brains are actually different than my brain. I'm a digital immigrant. I had to learn the language. You're digital natives. And you have no fear of technology, and you never did, because it's not technology to you. It's kind of like the air. It's like I have no fear of a refrigerator, you know? A third uh, factor is that we have a demand pull that Simon was alluding to from the new global economy. Our traditional institutions and corporations are failing they're failing in innovation, they're failing in job creation, they're failing in wealth creation. On the other hand, again, because of the web and a new generation, we now have the rise of a new kind of entrepreneurship. And little companies can have all the capabilities of big companies without the main liabilities, uh, deadening bureaucracy, legacy culture, and so on. And the fourth factor is, um, it's sort of, uh, mother, I'll call it uh, uh, invention is, uh, sorry, necessity is the mother of invention. In Europe, there's 47% youth unemployment in Spain, you know, where Telefonica, the host of this event, is coming from. I mean, young people all around the world, we told them you work hard, you develop a skill, a capability, you stay out of trouble, you can come into the economy and you can have a prosperous life. Well, my generation was not honest, or at least we were sure wrong about that one. So now all around the world, and I see this everywhere, Latin America, everywhere I travel, young people are saying, you know what, we're gonna have to do it ourselves. And you put all those together and you have a geek, if you like it, economy, where a whole new generation of young people is saying, we're gonna create wealth. We're gonna solve the world's problems. We're gonna change democracy. And uh, you extend that out, we're gonna bring down tyrants around the world. I mean, the internet drops 
the transaction and collaboration costs of dissent, of rebellion, and even of insurrection and revolution. So, you know, everybody's really depressed about this mess that the world is in. I could come to something like this. I've, I've never been more hopeful and more optimistic because we're going to change the world, but it's not going to be, you know, the leaders of the EU that are going to change the world. It's going to be people like the people in this room. Do you think it's it's the the newly found entrepreneurial drive of this new generation that's that's in turn driving this paradigm shift? Is that what you're saying that this new generation is they're more entrepreneurial? They're saying, well, we have to go out and do it ourselves than previous generations. Yeah, they're more entrepreneurial because they have to be, and because they can be. Like it's now possible to create a small company. Um, that can be an enormously influential and powerful and rapidly scaling organization. You could never do that before the way that you can do it today. Now, th that's not to say this is all easy. Because of the global crisis, small companies have difficulty getting financing. You know, banks are not lending money because of the, they've still got the hangover from the subprime uh, mortgage crisis. Venture capital is basically broken all around the world. But again, where there's a necessity for a new solution, it will be found. So you have things like Kickstarter, new crowdsourcing for financing. There are all kinds of new models on how you can not only get the human capability to build a new business, but you can also get the, the financial capability as well. John? Yeah, the, uh, the crowdfunding piece is really exciting, I think. And I swore I would not talk about crowdfunding, but here I am. Uh, just this week, uh, a webcomic launched an uh, Indiegogo campaign to raise $800,000, $850,000 US uh, to launch a Tesla museum. And it happened in a week. Uh, rewind 10, 15 years, that would be ridiculous. Someone would look at you and, tell, and say, you really need to see a doctor. Um, but this, this has changed. I mean, we are still in the middle of a recession. And be, you can, being able to raise $800,000 for cultural good uh, in a week is just, it's an amazing testament to the power of the network. And I mean, we even see this back in social change world. We have a fellow um, in, from Ashoka in Hungary. Uh, she's in jail right now. She's a midwife, and that's her crime. And uh, some filmmakers raised money on Indiegogo to, to do a documentary about it, really bring her to life and that film's going live in September, I believe. This ability to, to crowdsource your funding model uh, is touching every sector, touching technology directly, touching social good, and touching business and culture. Uh, it's really evaporated the entry cost uh, for startups. Simon, is this, um, this you know, new, new take on this young entrepreneurial spirit for someone like Google which obviously came out of that and is now a large, a large corporation. I, I mention this because in, in recent months, I cover the startup scene in Berlin and, and the, the Google is becoming more and more involved. They can see the potential perhaps a bit more. And um, obviously there's the, the Kunde Garage um, thing here, which involves Indiegogo as well, which is trying to you know, persuade people and, and help people to become more entrepreneurial. How, how important is it or, or what, what must large corporations like Google um, do to, to become more of a part of this? Well, you have to understand I mean, we are we're a global company building products for a global audience and so we've always had a, a, a global a, a global sort of ambition in terms of the way that we, we build our products. I mean we have office we have engineering offices in uh, in several countries. I mean our Munich office now has got to about 120 people and it's uh, it's still growing. Um, the so we need, we need people around the world uh, as engineers, but we also need, I mean, the internet is, is not just any one company. That's the whole point about it. It's a, it's a huge ecosystem of, of companies. So these startups that make the internet a more interesting place are, are absolutely vital to a company like, uh, to, to a company like Google. Um, we've been involved, we've obviously been the beneficiaries of, of the, the startup potential of Silicon Valley, but we've also been the, the benefits of the, of the open source movement and so on, because I mean, that's also vital to us, uh, to us setting up. But yes, we have been, we've been investing a lot now in, uh, in, in startups and, and supporting entrepreneurship around the world. 
Um, we've got a, a whole division that is focusing on promoting that entrepreneurship because making the internet just a more interesting place is 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 part is basically in our in our own business interest. Um, we're a company that benefits from an open, broad, fast-growing internet. What you've seen in Germany uh, with the Founders Garage down 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 there is a uh, is is a is a competition to start sort of promoting innovation. Um, I mean, I think that's also you know just for, I mean I'm a policy guy, right? So the idea of using competitions rather than sort of intellectual property is is already an important is an important distinction. We've got a bigger initiative in uh, in London where we've got um, I mean in London office space is a real premium. So we bought a bit of office space and we're now sharing it with a lot of startups in uh, in in London to uh, to help them get get a footing. Um, we need these. Uh, we, we want these entrepreneurs to, uh, to to develop. Ultimately, they maybe they become companies that we that we buy, but certainly they become companies that make the internet a more interesting place. And that's and, and it's bringing people onto the internet, which is which is the sort of gives it the business rationale for us. Okay, um, so Don, what about with the, the growing of the digital world? What about things like um, intellectual property in in these new business models? Well, under the industrial economy, there was a clear view of intellectual property. And it goes like this. I'm a company, I create IP, uh, I trademark it, patent it, a copyright it, whatever. I own it, uh, and I ought to own it forever because I invested in that. And you try and infringe it, and you're going to meet my legal team. Well, that didn't work so well for the music industry, did it? I mean, the internet was the best thing to ever happen to the music industry, but rather than having a business model innovation to correspond to a technological disruption, they took a legal solution, and the industry that brought you Elvis and the Beatles is now hated by its customers, it's collapsing, and it's suing children as its third largest source of revenue. So, we need to rethink intellectual property for a world where IP is no longer atoms, it's bits. And when IP becomes bits, it doesn't know all the rules of atoms, you know? If I'm a bit, I don't know that I can't be infinitely replicated and move around networks of glass and air at the speed of light globally. I, I don't know that rule. So it makes a lot of sense to have a very different view of intellectual property. And I'll just give you one example. Um, the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, has anyone heard, here heard of the patent cliff? The patent cliff? Okay. This is an amazing thing. The pharmaceutical industry in the next 12 months is going to lose 20 to 40 percent of its revenue. The whole industry. As all these drugs that have been under patent, like Lipitor, I think Viagra is one of them, they're all coming off patent and they're going to go generic. So. What do you do if you're a company and you're going to lose, say, a third of your revenue in the next year? I mean, what do you do? You cut back on office supplies or something. No. You need to fundamentally rethink your business model. And that involves rethinking your approach to intellectual property. The pharmaceutical industry needs to take a whole bunch of their research and data and place it in a commons. We need a Linux of clinical trial data, for example. They should share pre-competitive research. It's called POCM, Proof of uh, Clinical Mechanism. They should share something called comparator arm data. So I have a co compound, I, I test the compound, I test a control group, and I, I test a placebo. Well, I probably don't want to share that data, but I can share this data with other people. There's no harm to me in doing that. I mean, when Simon, what you're talking about, all the exhaust data in retail, there's all this exhaust data that happens in the pharmaceutical industry. Why not share it? See, it's a popular idea here, <laughs> at least. And so it's, it sort of gets to the point that for these new business models, you need to rethink your intellectual property strategy. And I'm not suggesting everybody give everything away. You need a portfolio of IP. Just like, you know, those of you who have a, a pension fund or mutual funds or whatever, so you, you have stocks that maybe are Asia and you got some high tech and you got some whatever. 
and then you, you've got different kinds of stocks in your portfolio. Well, we need portfolios of intellectual property, some that we own, some that we place in quasi-open commons. This is what Nike did with the Green Exchange. They're placing all this intellectual property about sustainability into an exchange where everybody can get access to it. And then some of your IP, you ought to just place it in a commons. I mean, that's what IBM did with Linux. IBM, Microsoft, and every IT company was confronted by the phenomenon of Linux. And most of them thought it was a really bad idea and they ought to kill it. Microsoft originally called Linux communism. You know, they said, why should something in the, in the society like an operating system be in a commons? This is communism. Well, IBM saw, thought the same thing for a while, and then they wondered, no, why don't we embrace Linux? And they did. They gave away $400 million of software to the Linux community, and in doing so, they saved themselves $900 million a year developing their own proprietary operating system. They created a platform upon which they built a multi-billion dollar hardware and services business, and they also got to stick it to Microsoft probably not in that order of importance. So they thought the portfolio approach to intellectual property. Most companies don't yet get this, and when you don't get it, eventually it's gonna kill you, because that's what it's doing to the music industry. It's very interesting you're talking about science and sharing, and um, I don't know if you've heard of uh, ResearchGate, which is a, a startup that's based in Berlin, also has a presence in, in uh, San Francisco, run by a guy called uh, Ijad Madish. And, and the whole idea of that is for scientists, scientists never actually shared uh, their data when things went wrong. They just kept quiet about it. So he's created this platform for scientists to be able to share absolutely everything, and it's having some in incredible effects. So what well, Do you know about like Galaxy Zoo? Does anyone here know about Galaxy Zoo? This, uh, this guy, Kevin uh, Zwicky, he's an astrophysicist. And because there are all these satellites up there taking pictures of remote galaxies, they have millions and millions and millions of, I sound, sound like Carl Sagan, billions and billions of, of galaxies that are not categorized. You know, are they elliptical? Are they, which way do they rotate? You know, all this kind of stuff. So he did the math, he figured it would take every astronomer and astrophysicist in the world a hundred years to categorize these. Then he wondered, no, we'll take the different approach. He reached out to amateur astronomers. There are now 275,000 amateur astronomers who are doing this. And they can do it, it turns out, as well as professionals. They're gonna have all this done in a year. I was just talking to him, he said the big challenge they have is they've written a cover story for the big astronomy publication and the big challenge is how do you write a story where you have 275,000 authors? Like, how do you list the authors for a story like that? So again, this is about placing things in the commons and about sharing. I, I think the interesting part about this is we're used to dealing with an economy of scarcity and that's how we make money. Something is scarce, therefore it's valuable. And, and we've shifted with digital world into an economy of abundance. Something is valuable because it's everywhere. That's what you create value with. And if you look at all these industries that have been flipped, it's not usually from the inside out, IBM being one case of the opposite, but look at the music industry. It was fans who wanted to share music and they built Napster and, and on and on. And it's uh, the same thing will happen in pharmaceuticals, I believe. Uh, you see a patient empowerment movement uh, showing up. Uh, Sage Bio Networks, I think, is one company. And they're taking patients w around diseases where they share and who are going into experiments and saying, hey, you are the owner of the intellectual property that this experiment on your body is producing. Why don't you take control of that and share it? And then that sharing allows others to do research on the same data for different utilities. So it's kind of a bottom-up approach to disruption. I think the, the, the there is this huge challenge in, in licensing content when making copies is so 
terribly easy. And, and this is where new business models comes back in again as, a, as being really a really vital sort of observation. Uh, I mean, we couldn't, I don't think anybody could invest more than Google does in terms of the R&D that goes into our search engine. I mean, you know, billions and billions of dollars gets invested. But with the end result, it's turned into a service. Um, and it's the service that's made available to people rather than the intellectual property. And the service is monetized through advertising. And advertising has been sitting there to help monetize a lot of services. And so a lot of the intellectual property created by geeks is, is monetized as a service rather than licensed. Right? And that's, I think that's a, it's a huge distinction from the music and film industry, which is still trying to license things. Now, the film industry has some experience of, 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 of a service. It's called cinema, and it's really thriving. Uh, the music industry has some, some experience of a service. It's called the concert, and it's really thriving. It's only when they're trying to license that, um, that, that, you, have, that you have this difficulty. Uh, I mean, an even better example from Google is what's happening in the mapping world. Right? I mean, people were selling mapping data, people like Garmin and TomTom and whatever, for, for, for years and years and years. Well, we just sort of said, no, there's another way of doing it. We can, this can be the, the, the beginnings of a whole new service called sort of location-based advertising and so on. And, you know, there are lots of, lots of issues to work through with all of that on the privacy side, but, but we flip the business model completely. Well, and in fact, that's what the record industry should have done for me. It should have changed music from being a product into a service. I mean, is there anyone here in this audience who will not pay three euros per month to have every song ever recorded in all of human history stream to you on any device, your, your mobile device, your car, your home stereo, your television, into your office with a whole bunch of value-added services. So I have all your playlists, or you can ask it questions like, give me uh, Joni Mitchell's favorite folk songs that she, she listens to, or what's Mick Jagger listening to before he goes on stage these days? Three euros per month to any music ever recorded. Is there anyone here who would not pay three, dollars, uh, three euros a month? The whole issue of intellectual property goes away. Nobody will steal music. Why would you take possession of the song? Does anyone here steal YouTube videos? You don't need to because you can have it at any time. But the record industry, instead of transforming its business model and changing the way that it thinks about intellectual property and making music a service, stuck with the old model, and as a result, it's collapsing. So um, there's huge lessons there. I actually have to say I do steal YouTube videos once in a while. And if you see me uh, tomorrow, I have two stolen YouTube videos because I didn't know what the quality of the internet um, but I mean, that's one, one area where the technology has to actually be consumer oriented as opposed to business oriented. Um, if I can stream and copy for later, save for later when I'm offline, uh, that's a very good user uh, experience, but it's not as often a business model. Uh, but generally that, that copyright just has to be more flexible. My, my follow up question was gonna be why, why these large music companies, why other large companies um, don't react and say, well, what we're doing is, is, is not working. Um, let's look at these other industries and see how it works with them. Why, why aren't they doing it? What's the problem? Well, I've worked in a few big companies and I think nothing scares a company more than cannibalizing its existing revenues. So I, I remember I posted something on Twitter just, I don't know, about 18 months ago where there was this article in CNET about how the iPod was, uh, iPad was destroying MacBook revenues. Well, it hasn't done Apple any harm, right? Um, I, I think you just need, you know, this is this is a this is a real struggle, right? I mean, we are all. I mean, there, there's a there's a very interesting parallel. You know, the music and the film industry terribly, terribly nervous about the internet. Well, Google and Facebook are a little bit nervous about the mobile world. Ask the financial analysts what they think about our prospects in the mobile world, and they've all got question marks about it. But can Google and Facebook not embrace the mobile world? No. I mean, we had to. We have to go in there feet first and try to find new business models within there. Now, it is cannibalizing, if you want, you know, all of the success that the, you know, us as companies have had on the desktop. 
but we don't have the luxury of staying in the old world and hoping that it will that it will carry on being you know printing money for us. You know we have to go, we have to move forward, and uh, and and, uh, and that's something that that you know you, you have to you have to be able to go with that. You have to recognise that cannibalisation is something that that happens because the world doesn't stand still, and and asking it to stand still is 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 what basically you know a lot of rights holders and and it's the newspaper industry above all in this country. Um, you know is 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 the problem. Yeah, I mean, to, to me it comes down to a question of, of leadership and culture. And like in the case of the music industry, we're talking about a new paradigm, okay? Paradigm, I'm allowed to use that word because I wrote the book Paradigm Shift. <laughs> um, but when you have a new paradigm, this is going to be a question here, you get a, you know, a paradigm is a mental model. Paradigms put boundaries around what we think they constrain our actions. And they're often based on assumptions that are so strong, we don't know that they're there. And the earth is at the center of the universe. That was a paradigm. The big problem in the world is communism. Remember that one? Most of you don't. Um, the purpose of computing is to automate existing business processes. Um, music is a product, and it's a product made of atoms. Well, something comes along, or art and science culture, that causes a shift to occur. And when that happens, leaders of the old paradigm have the greatest difficulty embracing the new one. Um, these things cause dislocation and conflict, uncertainty. They're nearly always received with coolness, or worse, mockery, hostility. I mean, these ideas, I've been writing about this um, I called it Everywhere Internet Audio. It's an article I wrote in 2002 in the New York Times. And I've had the music industry on my case ever since, being really angry at me. And uh, this is what happens when you have a new paradigm. So you have to somehow find the leadership for change. And um, that just didn't occur in that industry. So now the new models are emerging and they're coming from outside, Spotify, Google, uh, you name it, are going to reinvent the music industry. And it's going to be great for musicians. It'll be great for music lovers. Can you, you can get access to all music. And it will be great for the, the providers of music uh, as, as well. But it's a new model. Um, we will take some questions just in a, in a couple of minutes. Um, but I just want to finish by uh, asking you guys about uh, the future. We've talked about you know, what, what these new business models are, what they mean. Looking forward, what do you expect to happen? Uh, John, let's start with you. Uh, more of not the same. The, the ability of everyone to scale and enter the markets and disrupt entire industries from their backyard, uh, I think it's unpredictable, and that's actually the most exciting part about it. Uh, thanks, Simon. Yeah, unpredictable, and that's the most exciting part about it. I mean, that, that, that is the key point, right? But you have to have that. That's not a mindset that's, that's overall uh, present in... Uh, I mean, it's not overall present in society, and it's certainly not overall present in boardrooms. Yeah. Um, to me, the future is um, not, not something to be predicted. It's something to be achieved. And uh, that's a good strategy anyway, because it is unpredictable. <laughs> um, but I think that, you know, for a century and a half, we created wealth through a business model. It was called the Vertically Integrated Command and Control Industrial Age Corporation. And now we have infinite, an infinite number of new network-based models uh, that are emerging. and. Um, you know, in economics, we talked about a whole bunch of these. I mean, you have idea agoras. These are open markets for ideas. Uh, prosumers, turning your consumers into producers. Open platforms. Amazon's open API generates 40% of all of its revenue. Uh, peer production. There are these vast pools of labor like Linux or like what happens at Campus Party that you can tap into. Those would be four of hundreds that are emerging and um, we have no idea really where they're going to go. Okay, so let me, let me uh, rephrase that slightly. Just, just as a last question, um, are you hopeful, are you optimistic about the path that, that we're going down now? 
yeah, I think everybody in this hangar, I was going to say room, but I mean, everybody in this hangar is, is optimistic. And, and I think we've got every reason to be so. The, the capacity to change the world has never been closer to your fingertips. Um, you know, now what we need to do is to make sure that those people that want to change the world for the better are not, are not held back by, by, by forces that, that, that want to prevent that because they've got vested interests in, in incumbency. I mean, that's basically what I do as my day job, talking to politicians. Is you, you talked about evangelizing disruption. That, that's, that's what I do as my day job. I mean, I, I totally agree. One of the containers says, if you have a brain, you have a startup. And, you know, we were talking about earlier about how many entrepreneurs are there. Everyone is or can be. And, and, you know, one path is making sure government's not holding the back with policy is in line. The other path is finding ways to support and scale the entrepreneurs that are, that are taking action. And uh, so I'm, I'm insanely optimistic about where we're going. Uh, as am I. I mean, if you think about the old media, print, radio, television, broadcast, even the early days of computing, uh, they were all centralized, they were one to many, uh, they were controllable, and the people out there were inert. They were passive recipients of the media. What we've got now is the antithesis of that. It's, it's one to one, it's many to many, it's not centralized, it's not controllable, and the people out there are active. So, as such, this thing has an awesome neutrality. I mean, It'll be what we want it to be. And if we want it to be a tool to discover the heavens, it'll be that. If we want it to be a tool to organize against public education, like some people in the Tea Party are doing, it'll be that. If we want it to be a platform to organize unspeakable acts of evil, it will be that. So um, the thing that gives me optimism, though, is that there's more good people than bad people in the world. And I think that this is an age of participation. You can not only read the encyclopedia, you can write it. You can not only watch the evening news, you can produce it. You can not, not only use software, you can create software. And as people participate in the, by the millions and tens of millions around the world, we're all bringing our values and our legitimate expectations to the table. And, and that gives me great uh, hope that this new age is going to be an age uh, where the promise gets fulfilled. Great stuff. Right, uh, we'll take some questions. Thank you, again. Um, again, based on the idea that the business model is, um, is designed to create value, this value, not necessarily is profit, could be social value. So, in that case, what are your thoughts or your advice for social entrepreneurs? Thank you. Have impact. I mean, it's easy to have an idea and uh, to post your idea somewhere and, and get some minor traction, but to, to really start creating value, you actually have to start creating impact. Uh, sharing your ideas is one stage of that, but finding seed funding and accelerating yourself uh, to achieve impact, collaborating with others. The biggest problem in the social entrepreneurship world is almost too many startups and there's not enough collaboration going on because there's not enough platforms linking people together. So I would say have impact and collaborate are the, the two key pieces. So obviously I come from the commercial value side, um, but one of the challenges that the internet has and the geek economy has is that we have a system of government statistics which is all based on commercial value. So if you think about the, the GDP of Wikipedia, it's basically zero, it's the cost of a few servers. If you think about its value to society, and, and not, just to, not just to the West, but, but to the developing world above all, you know, it's, it's of huge value in that sharing of information with, with the developing world. Um, but its GDP is close to zero, so a key problem for the internet is that we don't measure the real value that comes from it. And that's one of the reasons why it's underappreciated by policymakers. So it's a, it's a very good question. Uh, next question. Uh, 
Um, in other talks um, here at the Hangar, we've heard a couple of times, or at least I heard, that um, sort of social valuable behavior in itself is becoming more or less a, a layer of new business models and that it also might be able to take money out of the equation. That when you do something good, you will get something bad, uh, back and that doesn't have to be money. What do you think about that? What role will money, which we have a problem with apparently in the world, will play in the future for future business models? Well, people participate in creating social value for all kinds of reasons. I mean, take Wikipedia. Um, they do it because it's fun, because it's a hobby. They like to be part of a community. They do it for their personal reputation. They do it because they hated Britannica. They do it um, because they want to make knowledge available to the world. They do it to boost up their resumes. I mean, I. If I get a resume from somebody who says I've written 50 Wikipedia articles, that says more to me than he went to or she went to Harvard Business School. She, you know, she's an entrepreneur. She's self-acting. She knows how to write. She's got curiosity. She knows how to collaborate. She knows how to defend her ideas and so on. So um, I think that that there's all kinds of intangible forms of value that start moving around and. Way back in the dot-com period, we used to talk about new forms of currency emerging that might replace traditional money, and that kind of never happened. But you can see it start to happen now. Um, there are all kinds of really interesting companies and organizations that are involved in value exchange that don't uh, involve money or partially in involve money. I'll just give you an example, a quick one. It's a company called GiveGet. Actually, this is too complicated to explain. But um, the bottom line is that when you buy something of a certain value, you get to make a charitable donation of half of that value. And they do it through arbitrage, They're using internet for arbitrage. They buy, of linking two parties uh, together where they buy stuff at wholesale, and then they, you buy something at retail, but you get to give money to a charity. So, um, They think that this can increase charitable donations in the world by 25%. So there are all kinds of forms of barter and other non-monetary forms that, uh, that are emerging. Reputation is a form of capital. It's, it's an interesting time. Are you guys... I mean, the only, the only true form of value is time. You, you trade your time for money. You trade your money for time sometimes. Um, so there are gazillions of new economies online, especially, that enable you to trade your talent, trade support for visibility. Um, some of them are completely uh, selfless. You're posting on Wikipedia. Uh, you're answering a wrong question on the internet. Um, and, but some have definite exchanges where you can trade, I'm going to do an hour of work now, and I'm going to time bank that and get an hour of work later. So I, I think that there are many possibilities for new economies in that world. Um, and social value is just one outcome thereof. So I think this is, this is one of the great challenges for, for a business. We obviously want to monetize. We want to make money. We've, we've got our shareholders to, to think about. And so, I mean, just to give you an example, I mean, basically, though, the forces that you talk about are, are so strong that a company has to accommodate them. So what does that mean for, for a search engine like Google? It means that our search engine has to be available to answer any type of question that anybody could possibly ask us because they want to know that answer. Now, our advertisers are only interested when the searcher is looking for something to buy, or you know, broadly speaking. So a large, large, large proportion of, our serv of the service that we provide is unmonetizable. But if we didn't provide it, then people wouldn't come there for the bit that we can monetize. So, and I think this is, this is one of the challenges for businesses to recognize that there's so much value that people experience on these platforms that you need to, that you need to work with in order to have the opportunity to, to monetize it um, from, from time to time. You see it with YouTube too, right? I mean, we have to have the videos of, of the dogs on skateboards, you know, to use the cliche. Um, even though it's only the music videos and, and certain other premium content that we actually monetize. But, but you have to work with that. 
and you can't try to sort of monetize everything. That's, that, that's one of the great challenges, but you have to be open to that. Thanks, I think we've got time for one more question. Anyone? No, down the front here. Hello. Uh, I think one of the things that slows down this paradigm shift you, you spoke about is that uh, leaders of the old uh, economy which have influence, uh, while well, I hold the mic, for, the mic for, uh, in the wrong direction, uh, which the, the, those leaders uh, have lobbyists in the, in, in the important places and they, they reject uh, this, this change, this shift. And unless the new economy has its lobbyists in the proper places, the shift will take uh, longer time than it, than it could. So um, the Pirate Party, for example, uh, has uh, emerged just to, to, uh, to, to accelerate the, sh the shift, but there isn't, um, there isn't much around. Um, instead of the Pirate Party or, or other uh, lobbyists for the new economy. We didn't really touch on, on the politics of this, which is quite, quite interesting, but is there, I mean, is there a political, I think the question really is, 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 there, is there political pressure to, to support these, these, these new business models? Uh, your point is absolutely correct. Um, I mean, I, I have a team of 40 people who all want to change the world for the better and talk to governments about, about doing exactly that. But, um, but we're up against armies of people that are saying the exact opposite and that the status quo is, is, the, is the place to be. But, and I think that's the opportunity in the, in the present crisis. Um, you know, a lot of policymakers today realize that the old world doesn't work. They're looking for new solutions and whether they're, you know, which makes them open to, to, to commercial input from, from companies like Google that have obviously found ways of growing and employing more people. Um, you know the the geek community, uh, which is growing and uh, and, and creating uh, creating new opportunities, but also to I mean, you know Don speaks to a lot of government people because they're looking for they're looking to understand this in a much broader context as well as to how they can uh, how they can embrace some of the forces that the, some of the the, the, the forces of, of collaboration, for example, and sharing and mass, mass collaboration, how that can be brought into uh, into government. Yeah, I mean, I, I think what's happening is there's, we're in the early days of an historic tectonic clash between the old institutions and modus operandi of the industrial age and the new stuff. And this is reflected in no better way than in government. I mean, for every one of these institutions, I said it's like a mass production model, one to many, right? Mass production, mass distribution, mass marketing, mass media, mass democracy, mass education. You know, education, I'm a teacher, I have knowledge, you're a student, you don't, get ready, here it comes. Um, everybody out there is inert. So in politics, it's I'm a politician, listen to this 30 second negative ad where I attack my opponent around an issue that you could care less about if you're a young person, then you go vote for me and I'm gonna broadcast to you for four years, and then we get to do it all over again. You vote, I rule. Actually, I'm not gonna broadcast to you all the time because in the United States, 75% of my time, I'm gonna be talking to lobbyists and raising money because that's what politicians do. They spend the vast majority of their time raising money. Oh. And when it's time to vote on something, I wonder who, I'm, what, what way I'm going to vote. If I vote the wrong way, I lose my source of funding and I'm no longer a politician. What's wrong with this picture? Like everything, it's so broken. In the United States today, you have this completely dysfunctional body politic. I won't talk about Europe, but because we don't have time, but um, where it's a dialogue of the deaf. And the whole society is lining up. You have the media lined up. And the purpose of information when you're watching Fox News or something, it's not to inform you. It's, it's to give you comfort. You know, we've all ended up in these little self-reinforcing echo chambers where all we hear is our own point of view. And so that's, we, we could change this. And we will change it. But to do that, it means that people are going to have to get involved. And 
when you have a transition like this from one era to another, these things are typically the midwife is dissent, it's, it's uh, rebellion, it's even insurrection. Historically, the change from feudalism to industrial capitalism was, it was called revolution, the French Revolution, the American Revolution, the natural democratic revolutions across Latin America. Now, I'm not suggesting you should all go get armed, you know, and bring about an insurrection, but in your place of work, in your community, in your, your school, in your family, in, uh, you know, in, in your startup, wherever you are, you know, we've all got a role to play in changing uh, the situation and if we all do it collectively there's huge power there's an unbelievable amount of power and I mean I don't want to go on about this but just one example during the Egyptian revolution everybody said Mubarak is too strong uh, the kids are gonna go home um, and I, I wrote that no actually they're not gonna go home in the case of Egypt if they went home, he would hunt them down and he would kill them. Now the stakes are not so high for us in, in Western democracies, but if we go home and we give up on this, uh, the future is not going to be a very uh, uh, bright one. So I'm, I'm on a big campaign to get people to do what you're doing here. Take action, participate, change the world. Great. Um, I, have we got time for another one or are we done? Oh yeah, was there one more question? Was there? Hello, thank you all. It's a really interesting debate. Uh, you were speaking about how uh, the paradigm shift in several uh, areas of human interaction. And uh, what I personally see really interesting is uh, a paradigm shift in banking and finance because it's still like the old and very defended old paradigm there and uh, you mentioned that there was some attempts to do alternative money which were not successful and I feel that there is huge huge lobby and huge energy put it to keep these attempts down and it's uh, it's very simple because uh, four percent of people control around ninety percent of current money so it's very important for them to keep it monopolized because uh, if there will be alternatives, the value of current money can decrease. So do you have any ideas about uh, how the shift in banking or in uh, finance could look like, or if there will be any? Over at the, um, the unconference space over there, I saw one presentation, I think it's going on Saturday night, on a Bitcoin-based crowdfunding platform. And if that won't break an entire model, I don't know what will, because Bitcoin provides a complete security around your financial transactions, and it provides a, a path into crowdfunding on any project. Uh, if you haven't been on the, the Silk Road website, which is a uh, service within Tor, and just browsed at the insanity that you can get there, um, I think the financial system is kind of next up in the big industries, uh, just to be kind of inevitably disrupted at a, a very interesting level. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, banking ought to be, I mean, amongst many sectors, the next one to be thoroughly disrupted by the internet. Um, it is a hyper-regulated sector, and regulation can be very much a way of protecting old business models. Um, actually, more often than not, I mean, you know, you can see quite often, quite a lot of um, companies now that have been calling for deregulation for, for the last... 20 years. I mean, Telefonica is a good uh, Telefonica is a good example. Telefonica has been saying they want to be deregulated as a telecoms company. Um, it's no longer clear that they're actually saying that any longer because they're beginning to see regulation as a way of slowing down disruption in markets. And I think the banking industry, uh, the, the banking industry is, is is one like that. I think it's interesting to note also that um, we had the we had one of the guys that that had led all of this. But there's this crowd financing. Um, I, I think it's not the Kickstarter model, but some of the other models where, where basically real credit is being created, so real sort of banking operations are happening. Um, the, they, they had to find bipartisan support in the, in the Congress and with President Obama to, to enable this, to change banking rules, to allow crowd financing to, to happen in the, uh, in the US. It doesn't, it's not possible under, under European banking rules. 
and so we'll need to get we'll need to get these changed now you know the idea of coming with sort of radical new clever ways of raising finance just at the moment that the prevailing vision is what we need is more conservative banking rules um, because we've just gone through this terrible crisis because of too lax banking rules. I mean, this is going to be this is going to be a real challenge because you know the the prevailing mentality is we should be more conservative, not not sort of new and innovative. Well, yeah, I mean the core modus operandi of Wall Street, its DNA almost brought down global capitalism, and it hasn't changed. So it's going to happen again if we don't fundamentally change the MO of the banking industry. And this is very fundamental stuff. I mean, it gets down to what is the purpose of a bank? You know, we as a society, we give banks a license to do things, to keep money safe, to make markets, capital markets, to lend money to people who need it, like entrepreneurs, you know? The banking industry is not really fulfilling the mandate that we have given them. And if you're an executive of a bank, I guarantee your focus is none of that. It's in a lot of banks, there, there are lots of exceptions, but in a lot of Wall Street banks, your focus is how to get back to big bonuses. 60% of all executive compensation in the United States goes to the tiny little financial services industry. So we need to fix that. And these kinds of things are radical, disruptive uh, changes that are going to... There's a burning platform now in the financial services industry. Like, what do you do with all these $2 trillion of, of toxic assets that are on the balance sheets of the big banks in the United States and some in Europe? It's actually $2 trillion plus or minus $2 trillion because nobody knows what they're worth. Well, you can't figure out what they're worth so they ought to place information about these assets into a commons. Bring all the world's leading modelers together, it's about 7,000 of them, let them go at it, create a Linux of risk management, value these assets, they can get them off the balance sheets, that means the banks can start to lend money again to entrepreneurs, and 80% of new jobs come from companies that are five years old or less, so that's the way to get employment going, and we can solve the problem of the jobless recovery and move towards a new period of, of, of employment and wealth creation. This all goes back to the modus operandi of the banks, and it's got to change fundamentally. If you would like to know more about that, I rant further. Uh, two things. I gave the opening talk to TEDx Wall Street at the New York Stock Exchange, and it was, I did come out alive, you can see, I did live. Um, but also, my new book, uh, Macroeconomics, talks about this quite a bit as well. Well, thank you very much. Um, John, you're speaking tomorrow? When and where? I'll be at the Hypatia stage at 11 tomorrow morning, talking about kind of how to scale social entrepreneurship. Brilliant. Um, well, thank you very much for listening, and uh, thank you very much to our panel. <laughs>